All right, Robert is with us and we are live. Can hear him. You can hear me. Yes, yes we can see you. Can hear you perfectly, brother. Okay. Um, we want to introduce you to the other good gentlemen here. Uh, Hello. Some of us are old friends. Andrew and I go mm. back more than, well, about almost 50 years, isn't it? Wow. At least 50. <laughs> <laughs> so, on your age. So okay. That's we went to okay. primary school together primary school. as well as to, or the latter part of primary school together as well as high school together. And then uh, lost touch for about 40 years there and uh, brought back together through the courtesy of the, of the uh, pandemic mm -hmm. or the lockdowns or the freedom movement mm -hmm. or however you want to phrase that. There's got to be a better way of looking at it. <laughs> but, uh, There's always some food that comes out of things. Sorry? There's always some positive comes out of adverse times. Exactly, brother. I guess brought together by the United Australia Party too, united by the United <laughs> Australia Party. But uh, of which Robert was also a, a candidate at the last election. So there you yep. go. Yeah, that's how we met. That that's how me and Rob know each other. Yeah, Robert. I just Andrew and I. Uh, Andrew's. And I think Robert would be interested to know something about your work on data analysis. So. Uh, Andrew, because it's um, cutting edge stuff. And we see all sorts of people quoting statistics about what's going on and about excess mortality and all that sort of thing. But you're actually the guy who has a handle on what those statistics really mean. Yeah, I started looking at the data, you know, towards the end of last year when some of the things in the public messaging didn't seem, didn't seem right. And so I actually got myself quite quite deep into it and to the extent that I've been assisting in several court cases um, wow. with that. So, um, yeah, no, it's been, uh, in, if, if, you know, a fascinating journey to, you know, uh, I've never sort of looked at public, public data and, uh, you know, analysed it in an independent light and you see very different things to what um, you, you're told. Now, when you say you've been a number of court cases, you don't mean this is because you're in the dock, you know, accused. No, of... no, no, no. <laughs> Assisting as a, as a as an expert in, in, in as something. an expert witness because if I you haven't been in the dock, I haven't been in the dock yet. <laughs> Thanks be to God. <laughs> All right, Lorraine, Rob, Rob, is what, what, what area are you Just in? Give us an F there. I don't know what that means. Fail. No, that's um. Take. That's better with you all. No, with you too, my friend. It was a typo. Quite likely. Yeah, that's you obviously know Lorraine well. She wouldn't um, say F to anybody. She's a very gracious soul. Uh, a, a good friend and a good woman. And uh, we're praying for her at the moment as she's uh, struggling a bit with her health. Okay. Uh, uh, Robert there says F means following. Thank you, brother. You obviously know the rain well too. I was thinking it might mean Father, forgive them. Okay. <clears throat> we got Jeremiah 29 verses 1 and 4 to 7. <clears throat> this is from the ESV. These are the words of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the surviving elders of the exiles and to the priests, the prophets, and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and live in them, plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease. But seek the welfare of the city where I've sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare, you will find your welfare. Thanks be to God. 
All right. A well-known passage from the end of Jeremiah. We've been following Jeremiah through his warnings given to the people of Israel, through his battles with other prophets who trivialized the danger they were in. And then last week we had the lamentations of Jeremiah where he wept as he found his prophecies come true. This week we're in Jeremiah post-exile. The people have been hauled away. Enormous numbers have been killed. But all the important people of the city have gone. Looks like he's left there for the moment. And he writes to the people. All right, Rob, I shouldn't steal your thunder. You were probably going to tell us all of that. but um... no, no, Well, it, it's funny because um, I listened to Audio Bible in the car, right? And it's, it's on Jeremiah 19, 20, and it got up to 29, 30, 31 last night. Um, yeah, this is... This is um, um, part of it where you're looking back you're like he's giving all these hard hard prophecies and people are like well, this guy's this guy's lying like there's no way god's not going to do that to us and then sure enough it happens but you know god in his uh redemptive nature which ultimately is jesus christ he says to them look i'm <laughs> even though you've done the wrong thing i'm still gonna there'll be a remnant i'll take you back and you know um, I'll, I'll still let you prosper, you know. And he's literally telling them in that passage, go and get married, eat, produce, multiply, you know. Um, and I think in, in a maybe I say this, but in the there's hidden uh, implication in that text is God is saying, I will bless you to, um, you know, uh, he's saying that they may be sons and daughters multiply there and do not decrease. He's implying that I will bless you and prosper you in that in these aspects. So, indeed, I just know from Cecily there, Jesus said they persecuted the prophets. Jeremiah was very heavily persecuted. Um, they put him in shackles. Was, was sorry? he the one? That was he the one in shackles or was that Ezekiel? They, they they dropped him into a sewer at one point. Yeah, right. You know, he was literally going to drown in crap. I mean, it's uh, he had a terrible time, Jeremiah. He battled with the <clears throat> prophet. He was imprisoned by the king. He was mocked by the people. Um, you know, he, he's, because we get so much biographical detail of Jeremiah, we know he was constantly persecuted. Church reformers have always been persecuted too, says says Cecily. Correct, indeed. Now, mind you, I didn't acknowledge that comment from Karen earlier who said she didn't watch the news. I don't think that's with reference to Jeremiah, but that was with reference to the early comment, uh, comment I think, from Andrew earlier. <laughs> <laughs> All right, when I um, read this uh, yesterday, the, the, the thing that struck me was... That, like there was a, a message to migrants or, or immigrants, you know, moving for whatever reason, having to relocate um, country and um, seek welfare of the city where I've sent you in exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf or in its welfare, you will find your welfare. It's like, you know, there's still a life to go on, go on and live your lives. You know, even though it's not ideal, you didn't want to be displaced but there's sort of, you know, a, a, a bit of a hope and, you know, for people who are put in a situation where they have to um, uh, migrate for whatever reason. So, you know, it's sort of a, a message that's probably still just as relevant, you know, relevant today. Well, I, I think that the um, very relevant and the, the Trinket's making that point there, the truth says continue to be persecuted. Uh, true, true, true enough. But I, I think the the big issue here for Jeremiah is there's no quick fix. I mean, <clears throat> what he's constantly battling against, say, particularly, most obviously in his battle with the prophet Hananiah, is um, this fatuous optimism, which comes from the fact that you know we've got the temple of the Lord here. You know, Jeremiah says, don't say to me the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, you know, as if that's some sort of lucky talisman that's going to save you. You know, if you're not following God, you're not being obedient, you're not doing what you're called upon to do, expect your um, uh, protected status is, is not going to continue. 
and uh, it, th this sort of fatuous optimism. It, it's, uh, I think it was uh, John Bright who said that the covenant of God with Israel goes the people on the one hand of an unshakable faith uh, in hardship and conversely a fatuous optimism in the face of their own sinfulness. You know, that, that's, that's the flip side. And it's the fatuous optimism that you see Jeremiah constantly railing against. And uh, he, he railed against it during his prophetic career before the uh, Babylonian armies came in, in uh, uh, 722, uh, sorry, 587, isn't it, uh, BC, and destroyed Jerusalem and hauled away all the inhabitants. And what's amazing is you see the fatuous optimism continuing. So, oh, don't worry about this exile. It won't last long. We'll be back in a short time. No need to settle down. God's going to return us. And Jeremiah says, settle down. Have sons and daughters, you know, establish yourselves. You're in for the long haul. There is no quick fix. I mean, so, that's relevant so, to us too, isn't it? Because we've seen so much calamity in our world in uh, recent years. It, it's, uh, you know, from a faith perspective, you, some people might say, oh, don't worry, God's going to solve all this. You know what I mean? But maybe we're in it for the long haul. Maybe there's no quick fix. Maybe we're going to have to endure this for a while before we come through. Gentlemen? Yeah. I, I I would agree because, you know, people, and, and I think back of the story when uh, Moses led um, the Israelites out of uh, captivity in Egypt and they come to the Red Sea and Moses says, okay, we're just going to watch and see the Lord wipe out their armies. But it wasn't happening. And so the people were crying out. Where are you? Where are you? And the Lord says to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the people to get moving. And at that point, once they started moving, Moses parts the Red Sea. Okay. So I think, you know, we're, we're not supposed to just sit on our idle hands and think, okay, the, God's going to take care of everything. You know, we need to be a part of this. We need to move forward. We need to continue to move forward to achieve God's kingdom here on earth. Any other comments? I, I was just I was just thinking um, the before all this happened, right? Everyone thought it'll never happen. Most people, you know, because yes. um, right. You're talking about us or about Jeremiah's time? Well, <laughs> both. Um, they, I, they 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 do say some people say history repeats. Others say history doesn't repeat, but it rhythms and rhymes. So there's a lot of um, wisdom if you're willing to look into scripture to apply it and go hey that's very similar like it's all good here and now we're going through this hard time uh, a squeezing you know um you don't make you don't make uh, olive oil out of leave, just leaving the olives there or grape juice you gotta it's gotta be crushed to get the juice out right um, I, mean, I was just thinking um, how basically the familiarity breeds contempt. They're like, oh, I'll be fine. God will never do that. Um, and, yeah, we've seen, for me anyways, I've seen a lot of similarities in the last, say, you know, especially the last two and a half, three years. Um, and that's the thing. These people, when they did get taken into captivity, you know, and some of them didn't make it back. <laughs> there wasn't. God's not talking to every single in he's saying, Oh, I'll take some of you back. So um, you know, there's always, as you said, there is a I, I said there's a redemptive plan, and I agree with you that these things take time, but uh oftentimes it's to the benefit of the society, uh, as harsh as that sounds and as harsh as it looks. Um, you know, they they were able to um come back to a point with God and um, yeah, I think I think again the the parallels to our society now. Like, there's a for me, 
I find a lot of people they're missing the God aspect. They don't have God in their life. Um, you know, human beings were not made to live without God. That's that is one hundred and ten percent true. So, yeah, I think the comparison is quite chilling in some ways. So, as you say, people said it would never happen, and that that's you know we look at the things that have happened in our world in the last couple of years. No, that will never happen. And that's, yeah, that's the same thing that people were saying in Jeremiah's day. No, 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 no. God will protect us. These things won't happen. God is good. We've got the temple of the Lord here. Nothing's going to go wrong. And so we become lazy. And, um, yeah. Those words from Trinket there, we need to stand against corruption and tyranny. That's against the sort of she'll be right, mate, attitude essentially yeah. expresses there. Yeah. I must give a greeting here to uh, Kamini as well. But uh, sorry, we're going to pass to the second reading, I think, sorry, to uh, Andrew. So I'm going to remove Sam, Robert, and myself. Second reading is um, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 8 to 15. Remember Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, a descendant of David. That is my gospel for which I suffer hardship, even to the point of being chained like a criminal. But the word of God is not chained. Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect, so that they may also obtain the salvation that is in Jesus Christ with eternal glory. The saying is sure, if we have died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. Remind them of this, and warn them before God that they are to avoid wrangling over words, which does no good but only ruins those who are listening. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved by him. A worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly explaining the word of truth. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Right, brother, offer, offer us your thoughts on that one. Well, there's another prophet in chains, unfortunately. Yep. Yes. Um, I, uh, I, I liked the, the part, um, warn them before God, that they are to avoid wrangling over words, which does no good, but only yes. ruins those who are listening. Yeah, it's interesting. You think of most of the breakdowns between within the christian community ever since have been a wrangling over words haven't they yeah yeah and you know words are so important it just you know and ruins those who are listening to um you know and just listening to um robert you know robert what he expressed um just just a moment ago um you know a worker has no need to be ashamed rightly explaining the word of of truth it's um so important in this time to be like that, you know, expressing what you, you know, what you believe is right. No need to be ashamed. So I like, you know, I like I got a lot out of um, this uh, this passage. You know, a similar theme of persecution, um, but uh, Christ will always uh, be there. Yeah, I think the other remarkable thing here is how Paul continues to put himself forward as an example. Even though he's, though he's in prison and he's, he's suffering and the rest of it, you would, you know, sort of be like me. You'd, um, you'd hardly think this was the time to be putting himself forward as the sort of uh, example that others would like to follow. But, but he does. He, he was I mean, accused of being a um, 
a super apostle, remember? He goes, yeah. I'm not the least of these super apostles. Like, um, I mean, look, you, you're saying he keeps putting himself forward, but he, when he said, in verse 11, when he says this saying is trustworthy, for if we have died with him, we also live with him. That's not just a saying. That is a revelation and a, a, a truest understanding he has that, hey, I know if I die, because he saw, remember, this guy saw and heard Jesus Christ in the sky going, why are you persecuting me? And then scales happened to him and then they had to be cast off and then he spent years in the desert learning and then he's doing miracles like you read in Acts. So Paul's not making a small statement based on, oh, it's just, you know, faith. And no, this guy's, that's why he keeps putting himself forward because he knows God keeps backing him. You know, um, you know, to the to the point that he just wants to talk about Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God to, to to death. Like you know, he he was warned, "Don't go. You'll get bound in Jerusalem." I think it was was it Rome or Jerusalem? And he's like, "No, no, I'm going to go anyways." It's like, okay, now you're not listening. <laughs> um, and so that's that's how I interpret this. You know, first part that he's he knows he knows he knows right, and um, the. The bit about quarreling of words, I've I've heard it best. It's um, it's non-salvation issues. You know, that's when you read in Ephesians, it says there's one Father, one faith, one baptism, one Spirit, one 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 Jesus, one 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 one. Yet you look in Christianity, and it is divided through divisions yeah. of uh, denominations, uh, and a lot of it is based on well, this word doesn't mean what you say it means, and you don't believe how I believe. And, um, you know, I think, um, again, tying it back to our modern day, I do believe, and I'm starting to see it, I'm telling you, I probably, I did not think I would exist in this period of time, but I'm starting to see God move in a way where he is, he's pulling these divisions out because he is like, do we all yes. claim he's our father? Well, then shouldn't we all work together as a body of Christ? You know, like, but we've all sort of separated ourselves, divisions, and um, you know, it's it's like it's like if the twelve tribes of Israel, when they have to come to war, like, no, I'm not we're working with that tribe. I'm not working, but you're all Israelites. We all you're all needed on the battlefield. Oh no, 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 yes. we're not, sorry, we don't agree with that tribe because they don't they don't like our oil or they didn't like our wine or. And it's the same thing, you know, and um, that's, that's, I think part of it is also human nature. So, well, it, it's tribalism, isn't it? We, we quickly break down into our tribes. Whereas uh, I think Paul's vision was that Christ could unite us. And I agree, we're starting to see it happen, thanks be to God. Yeah. Maybe it took, you know, a pandemic and, overreach of government and all the other things going with it to sort of uh, pull people together. But, um, yeah. I, I, I see day. a comment. Sorry. One lady made a comment that um, the last one, they burnt people at the stake over words, I think. No, they did. They, I, I've read it before. Um, they burnt a guy over, he didn't agree with the church on a word, and they're like, you're going to death. So... Insane. Yeah, in fact, I was telling Father Dave a couple weeks ago about the story of uh, Michael Cerritos and John Calvin. Yes. And John Calvin had him burned at the stake because, yep. the, the, he, and he was a Christian theologian, Michael Cerritos. You know, he he would he would not say the eternal the eternal Son of God. He would say the Son of the Eternal God. And all he had to do was say Eternal Son of God, and John Calvin would have spared him. Okay, a long comment from Robert here too. When being a missionary in India, there was one missioner per million. I realized we all need just to lift the banner of Jesus and stop arguing over non-important things. Beautifully put, Robert. Thank you. Robert was a missionary in India for, for many years. And, uh, yeah. Adversely unites us. I was going to ask you a question, Father Dave, but it was just a part of the passage that I, I, I'm not sure I understood the subtlety of, where it says, um, if we endure, we'll reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we're faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. It was, if we deny him, he will deny, 
deny us if we are faithless he remains faithful i, I i'm not sure i understood yeah, but those two verses seem to be in contradiction with each other don't they that's what i mean yeah that's what i wasn't sure yeah I understood. yeah 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 it's a bit jarring isn't it and then you if you throw in there saying, if, if we're faithless he'll remain faithful you know if, if we deny him he he won't deny us but i we'll <clears throat> It's a reminder that we're coming out of a context where people are paying with their lives for profession of their faith. And uh, here and elsewhere, we get a strong push not to deny your faith, not to abandon the way of Jesus. Um, though even so, within that context, there is the promise that he will always be faithful to us. Well, and to throw something else in there that Jesus said, and maybe you can help us tie this, or at least me, <laughs> tie this all in together. Um, you know, Jesus says that blasphemy against him can be forgiven, but blasphemy against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. Yes. So so how does that, now that wrench that I just threw in there fit into this? <laughs> Yeah, I'm not sure that, that, that we can connect the two. I think the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit that comes up in, I think it's Mark's gospel, it's out of a story where Jesus is healing some deeply possessed people and the uh, religious leaders say he casts out Satan uh, in this. In, By the finger, in this. Finger, finger of the devil. Yes, Yes, suggesting that Jesus himself is of the devil because he casts out, is using the power of Satan to cast out Satan. Uh, and Jesus' comment then, I think, is how I interpret it, is if you read, you reach the point where you see something beautiful happen like that, like the healing of a possessed person, and you still call that evil, then there's no hope for you. Uh you know, like if you see a clear manifestation of the Spirit of God who comes in love, joy, beauty, and truth, and if, if you call that evil, you, you've really, you've gone too far. That, that's how I see it. Yeah. It's the point where you've now sacrificed your own conscience and uh, slipped into that level of psychopathy where black is white and right is wrong. And there are certain points where when you've abandoned your entire moral sense, it's a sickness unto death. That, that's how I see that, um, uh, the, the sin against the spirit. Uh, I think it's the sort of thing perhaps that we see in uh, psychopathy where people have now have, and there are a small number of people, thanks be to God, but the great tragedy where people have lost all sense of uh, right and wrong, good or bad. Uh, how that relates to this passage, I'm not sure it does. I think, on the contrary, the, the the overall emphasis there is that Jesus is the same yesterday and today and forever. I think that Paul says uh, last week, and um, God, He will remain faithful. Don't deny Him, but He will remain faithful. Now, there's more questions here about Calvin. Did you want to fill that in? What issued did Calvin have with, uh, uh, it was essentially Calvin was fighting Arianism. That's uh, Rob's comment. Uh, did you want to get, give us a little bit more background on that, Sam? Well, it, it just in specifically with the Spanish Christian theologian, Michael Cervitas, um, Cervitas did not believe in the Trinity. And he wrote a book called uh, The Three Treatises of the Trinity. And he also wrote a book, uh, The Restoration of Christianity. Um, and he felt that um, Christians should go back to what the original, pos the, the message the original apostles brought, which, you know, the concept of the Trinity didn't come forward until the Council of Nicaea. And he saw an issue with that. So it's not that he didn't believe in Jesus. He, 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 he couldn't wrap his head around this concept of the Trinity, which I know a lot of people have uh, trouble wrapping their con you know, head around it. I'm with you, Sam. I think he's wrangling about words. Yeah. 
I mean, Cecily says, says that justify murder? No. No. No, it doesn't. It doesn't justify anything. Just it doesn't justify a breakdown in friendship and communication, let alone murder. I mean, I mean, I know, I know a lot of people that struggle with the Trinity. Yes, my mom, moments, exactly. Yeah, my mom told me a story while I was growing up. She she was considering being a Catholic nun. I was raised in Catholic Church, and she went to her mom when she was maybe in her late teens, and she said, "I don't get this, the Trinity thing. I just don't get it, mom." And her mom said to her. And sometimes you just got to take some things on faith. That was my grandma's answer to her. Beautiful. Look, I'm, I'm going to, we're, we're going over time a bit, which is great, but I think we need to move on to the gospel reading. So if you forgive me for a moment, I'm going to remove you, good gentleman. I do appreciate the participation of everybody today. I hope we can get some more good people like Cecily Trinket, and uh, Kamina to join me in future weeks in in the, the in this uh, online. Give us a reading. Give us some prayers. Join the discussion. We'll stand for the gospel. Holy Gospel. Let me find it. Holy Gospel is written in the 17th chapter of the Gospel according to Luke, beginning at the 11th verse. Now he, on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going to a village, <clears throat> there was a man who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said to them, go, show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back, praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, were not all ten cleansed? <clears throat> Where are the other nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? And then he said to him, rise and go, your faith has made you well. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. All right, gentlemen, our final reading. We're going to be a little briefer with this one, I think. <laughs> um, it's a beautiful story. I think the fact Jesus, the healing of the lepers, it looks like something out of the living dead, I think. if you, I'm not big on zombie movies, but my understanding <laughs> is that what was labelled leprosy in New Testament times wasn't necessarily what we call leprosy today. It could be any sort of skin disease, but particularly there was a form that made your skin go sort of white. So the image of people walking around as a band of lepers would look a little bit like scenes you see in those current zombie movies. No one eating brains, of course, but uh, people looking like images of death. And maybe that's why it scared people. But, uh, you know, one of the well, interesting things about this is it also breaks down barriers. You find there's a Samaritan in the group. It's and, always the uh, Samaritans, the good Samaritan or this Samaritan. It's always the, uh, the foreigner that turns out to be the good guy. Yeah. Yeah. In, in today's society, you, you could look at leprosy metaphorically. You know, I don't know about Australia, but here there's still a big stigma against people with mental illness. Well, that's a good point. Yeah. Yes, they don't have to band around together going un unclean, unclean, thankfully. We try and be a little more accepting nowadays than we once were. But, um, yeah, I mean, look, I think not wanting to make any real comparison, but the unvaccinated were um, considered unclean for a while. We were... Um, I think we still are. <laughs> Yeah, they're at a, well, uh, we don't have to hang bells around our neck and call unclean, unclean wherever we go, but there's, there's still, 
<laughs> and I and I certainly won't need uh, Jesus to heal me. That's for sure. In <laughs> from anything from being unvaxxed, I'll just say that. Um, no, this is this is actually a good um, passage of scripture, actually, because um, this is I'll share my thoughts if that's okay. Um, Please. So he's going between Samaria and Galilee. So he's in between probably a region where there is a lot of Samaritans. And what you're finding is these, um, um, if I if I remember correctly, leprosy, uh, according to the Old Testament law, you had to be separated because they, yes. they didn't yes. want to catch it and they didn't yes. want to, tra- yes. you know, they didn't, I don't know if they understood <laughs> how it worked exactly, but obviously it was a disease you caught or something. So, you know. Um, the fact that Jesus just, you know, just goes, yeah, he doesn't care about the leprosy because he knows he's the son of God. Nothing's going to touch him this way. Um, what I do find interesting is that out of the 10, only one come back, right? Yeah. Maybe the other nine were so overjoyed. They were like, I've got a life to live now. And thanks, God, you know, and oftentimes, and I, look, I've been there personally myself where, I know God did in me a miracle and I've just turned my back on him and gone thanks and just ignored him. So, you know, um, you know, so that's, 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 I think part of it is that these, these 10 would have been able to be restored back into society. Um, Nine of them never had a change of heart. You know, they had a change of flesh, whereas the Bible always says have a change of heart, not a change of flesh. It's yeah. They just took it for granted, didn't they? They just thought, you know, they were deserving of healing and the Samaritan didn't take it for, for granted. He was uh, grateful. Maybe he heard about the other Samaritan, the Syrophoenician woman. <laughs> yeah, the other one. You never know. These stories would have traveled. they got nothing to talk. They don't have Facebook, but what are they talking about? There's no football teams. There's no uh, married uh, at first sight. There's no funny shows. So um, yeah, it's um, it's good, and it's, it's it's again, it um, you know, the glory is all to God uh, because He's the one that is, he, He's always interested in in what is afflicting the the people, you know, the the human beings, you know, He's all you know, like a lot of people think, oh, God's so far away, He's not, He's literally always here, you know, if you just let Him into your heart, you know, just accept Jesus, receive that Holy Spirit. You know, and and I know, like in my life personally, God has fixed so many problems. Um, you know, I, and I'm not deserving. I know that for sure, hundred um, percent. You know, sinner here, uh, but God is good. You know, He, as they said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. So often He does. God is very merciful. Like, you know, I often think this whole last three years could have been worse if God was not involved. Um, you know, I think you know maybe we. Should, but I don't know. I don't want to say anything, but it could have been way worse. But I, I do believe God is merciful um, and he spares a lot of people more often than they know. I heard it in so many testimonies from people too that they, they when they come to Christ eventually, they're like, when I think back, God was sort of keeping me alive. It's like, yeah, because God is good. Beautiful. Anybody want to offer any closing comments? On on just in general? Um, well, yeah, look, um, I think... On the ratings. Yeah, of course, of course. I'm not going to just... <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, especially with, you know, Luke and uh, Jeremiah... Um, and even, I guess like, you know, it's, it's, Hey, you know, you've had this, there's this bad thing that's happened, you know, there, but there's a solution God provides at the end. And Paul also says this, like he says, this is a trustworthy saying, right? He's experienced it himself. So, you know, I just, I just want to say with these passages, you know, that even though we experience hardship, we experience suffering in this life. Um, I do believe, like, look at these 10 lepers and look at the exiles. Without God, it'll be much more difficult. With God, yes, you there will be suffering. You will have problems. But God is able to make a solution, you know. And I can testify 110% to that. Like, my life has been turned around since I became a Christian, like, 
15 years ago now, something like that, 16. Um, so, and that's it. It is, it is honestly a trustworthy saying that for me, the whole Bible is, um, is real. It's alive. And, um, yeah, I, I, I would encourage people to go back and read these scriptures and just, um, let God, you know, maybe give you an idea of, of what he thinks as well. Cause it is God's word. So, yeah. You've got no man there from Khomeini. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> <laughs> Beautifully put, brother. And, I mean, there's there's an interesting balance in these passages, isn't there? Because on the one hand, there's stories of healing and new life. And on the other hand, we've got Jeremiah saying it's going to take a while. <laughs> <laughs> it's not necessarily a quick fix. You know, and then you see some Paul rejoicing in his suffering, but he's still suffering. It's where we find ourselves. It's been great having you gentlemen with nice me. Nice meeting you, Robert. Likewise. Great, uh, yeah, yes. fantastic. Thank you for your wisdom. Thank you for your faithfulness. And um, and I'd like to say you. we actually wrapped that up pretty quick. It's only four minutes past the hour. <laughs> we, we've done well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I used to say the two things I've learned in life is you can't show too much respect and you can't make your sermons too short. So... <laughs> I don't know if it's the same with our sort of Bible discussions. I'm conscious I could go on for ages, you know, uh, nattering away with you good people. But uh, I, I figure I, I don't want the uh, to go beyond the concentration span of um, some of the other participants and uh, that oh, who may course. well have other things they need to get to after right. after an hour. Which, um, no. Anyway, don't, don't, want, don't want to bridle us when we're, when we're in full flight. But uh, we will have another opportunity to uh, share on the scriptures again. It, it's great, really, in a sense that you put put us together. There's no shortage of discussion. I mean, the scriptures may be a couple of thousand years old, but they still evoke um, passionate discussion today, as they always have. Yeah, tremendous amount. No, I've got a lot personally after the times you've invited me, Father Dave, just listening to people like Robert and Sam and their experiences and uh, profession of faith that um, I've just in these last few months, it's uh, given me a lot of strength. And, you know, just a couple of things out of the passages today are things that will help, help me keep going. Bless you, brother. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Father Dave, Good Sam, Andrew, Robert. Amen from our dear friend Lorraine, who we are praying hard for. Praying for you every day, Lorraine. Be strong, it's my weird. friend. Encourage you other good people to keep praying for dear Lorraine. Thanks to all there from Trickett. Extra time is worth a lot to me. God bless you. What's Karen say? Oh, I could listen for ages. God bless you, Karen. <laughs> Maybe we'll test that sometime, Karen. <laughs> Maybe it's just me then that's been conscious about not, not wanting to uh, uh, go too long. But, look, if you've got time, come and join us in the uh, Skype meeting room, fatherdave.net forward slash meet. We'll take you straight there. We can have another chat. There's a prayerful farewell there from Kamini. It's been good to have you with us, sister. As I say, if you're able to have a quick chat with us now in the meeting room, please do. Otherwise, I look forward to having you back in next week. Some of you wonderful women, as I say, we would love to have a less male-dominated team. Not that this isn't a great team today, but I think uh, we've had Diane, and, and uh, but it would be great to get some of the other. We've got a wonderful group of faithful women who are part of this little community, and it would be great to have you share some of your wisdom with us. All right, I'll shut up. Any final words from you, good gentlemen? No. <laughs> Just God bless everyone. God bless everyone. God bless you Thank all. you, brothers. Thank you. God Thank bless you. you. Thank you for uh, making this av available for, uh, for us. Yeah. God bless you, Andrew.